I'm not gonna lie, we talk a lot about death, ways to die, and poop in this one, so you've been warned. The other night I was laying in bed, contemplating my place in the universe, when a thought popped in my head. Wait a minute. If you poop when you die, then how can you ever actually be buried alive? Oh yeah, it's all coming together. You'd think such a telltale sign would be a pretty good indicator of death, making it almost impossible to get it wrong. When I began my research, I found the answer wasn't as simple as I thought it'd be. Before we get started, I do want to say I'm not a medical professional by any stretch of the imagination, so if you do have any serious medical questions or concerns, just, just call your doctor. So today, we're going to take a look at some of the myths about people pre and post death and see if some of the myths about being buried alive or defecation post death hold any water. Everybody poops. So let's start the video off with the big one. Do you poop yourself immediately after you die? Is it true? When you die, do you always defecate yourself or is it just a myth? I don't plan on dragging this out for the entire length of the video, so I'll just say it straight away that no, when you die, you don't always just immediately poop yourself. However, that doesn't mean it's as simple as that. I found an article created by the website todayifoundout.com that interviewed quite a few different doctors, nurses, and morticians. Generally speaking, the percentage likelihood of defecating right before or right after you die is roughly between 20 to 50%, with a few caveats that I'll mention in a minute. To put it bluntly, as of this recording of the video, there hasn't been a scientific study conducted that specifically measures the percentage of times people will defecate right after death. Realistically, and all joking aside, do you really want to be that person that walks up to someone whose grandfather or grandmother is about to pass away and ask them, hey, can I measure if they crap themselves? So this makes things a little difficult in gathering hard numbers on what the general statistics are in regards to how often this phenomenon actually happens. To quote paramedic and host of the podcast Medical Confessions, Scott Hiskey said, if someone went to the bathroom just prior to death, maybe not. If they have renal issues, probably not urine in their bladder. So that means for all you people out there that have an irrational fear of defecating when you die, well, just make sure to go before it happens. You know, if I've learned anything while researching this topic, it's that people in the medical industry have a really wicked sense of humor, and honestly, you'd kind of have to. Interestingly enough, though, when asking the various medical professionals how often does a person actually defecate when they die, Surprisingly, the initial answer was almost always, quote unquote, depends on what they died from. So for those of you that have coprophobia, the fear of feces, you're not completely in the clear because there are a few more less than savory scenarios that could occur. Aside from defecation after you pass, there is always the chance that you will defecate yourself right before you die. Trauma or seizures that result in death are generally the culprits in this scenario. These will likely lead to the defecation of oneself. Mainly because the nervous system, for lack of a better word, kind of freaks out. The muscles really aren't in control unless the body lets go of anything potentially held in there. Little side note, most of the medical professionals stated that urine is far more likely to be evacuated than poop is, so... Take from that what you will. However, there are two ways that will almost ensure that after you pass away, the medical staff will call a code brown on you. Funny enough, I dated a nurse a few years back and she also referred to it as a code brown. So I guess that's true, even though I thought it was just like a joke people would say on the internet. The first is organophosphate poisoning. The consumption of pesticides or anything similar in nature because it can also exist in medications as well. Essentially what happens with this bad boy is once enough is ingested into your system, it attacks the nicotinic receptors as well as the muscarinic receptors. Now I'm going to throw up this handy chart while I explain. Essentially, nicotinic receptors are found in your central and peripheral nervous systems, as well as muscles. They are what gets communicated to you from the brain down through the spine. While the muscarinic receptors are utilized to regulate the various functions in the body, like the central nervous system, and like the nicotinic receptors, are in charge of receiving that data being transmitted from the brain down the spinal cord and to the rest of the body. I'm oversimplifying this topic exponentially, but when you consume poison, essentially what happens is your body begins begins to kind of go on the fritz and your nervous system starts to shut down. And what happens if you are unable to control the basic functions of your body? Code Brown. I have some articles linked below that go into more detail on how the muscarinic and nicotinic receptors function if you are interested. However, the final way we will discuss today how you can almost certainly guarantee a post-death defecation, and that is through anaphylactic reactions or anaphylactic shock. An allergic reaction. To quote an unnamed nurse from the website, it depends on why they died. 
I'd say if the cause, quote unquote, of death was allergic reaction, then probably gonna happen. But really depends on the cause. I'd say 20 to 30% if not allergic reaction. What they are generally referring to is that the person died after going into anaphylactic shock. Essentially, your body's immune system creates a bunch of inflammation in an attempt to flush out the allergen, while at the same time flooding and attacking various sectors of your body. This is why adrenaline injections are the first form of defense against anaphylactic shock, as it helps to increase the blood flow in your body in an attempt to reverse the overcompensation from your immune system while it attempts to get rid of the allergen. There are four different grades when it comes to the severity of anaphylactic shock, but really only grade three and four affect the digestive tracts. As in those grades, the person suffering from anaphylactic shock will experience symptoms like vomiting, diarrhea, bloating, and the urge to have a bowel movement. To poop. Now, I couldn't find an exact reason, but my guess why you're more likely to poop after going through this is it's your body's natural reaction to try and eliminate the allergen from the body as efficiently as possible. All that extra inflammation has to go somewhere, and perhaps the body knows that it does not want this in the system. So the best course of action would be to flush it out ASAP by pooping. So long story short, you can still have an accident before or after death, but it depends on the circumstances. Now, let's say you've made it through your hospital stint and you were able to avoid crapping yourself in front of your family. Good job, because that probably ain't gonna be me. You're still not out of the woods yet, as there is still gas buildup inside your body, and that's gotta go somewhere, right? Or, what if you made it through all this harrowing shit, only to wake up buried alive? Well, the next myth I wanna cover is in regards to the gas buildup in the average person, and probably even more crazy, is the myth of exploding caskets. Spoiler, it's true. Now, when you pass away, your body is slowly shutting down. It's not a one-stop and boom, you're done type of deal. Sure, you are gone, but your body is still changing, and the natural gas is built up inside of you are slowly escaping. It's actually not uncommon for quite a few days after death that you'll fart, especially with the coroners moving you around and needing to bend to change your clothes, put you in a casket, etc. The best example I found online was using toothpaste and pushing on it. This is basically your body expelling gas and sometimes poop. And this is where the exploding coffins come into play. Now, the industry of death is pretty fucking shady in general. In fact, Penn & Teller's Bullshit did an excellent episode quite a few years ago on the subject matter. But for today, I wanted to focus on one specific type of casket that a lot of these different morticians will attempt to sell you. Or rather, these are seals that are placed on the caskets in order to quote unquote seal in the freshness of the recently deceased individual. Which, I don't know, seems weird. On one hand, the body's gonna decompose anyway, so what's the fucking point? And two, it seems kind of trashy to like prey on people who are grieving at this point. So put two and two together, you have a recently dead person who is still decomposing and more likely than not still releasing natural gases, and you have stuffed them in a box with a sealant on it designed to keep the elements out in order to maintain the freshness of the body. Sure, the outside elements can't get in, but the inside natural gases can't escape either. The Washington Post put it best when they said it essentially turns the casket into a pressure cooker. Now, it's very easy for me to sit here and say, oh, don't buy this, you're being manipulated by such and such, but you know, you're already grieving and going through shit anyway, so if you are going through that, then most likely I would just say, grieve in the way that makes you happy. Now, moving on to our last topic, being buried alive. So to absolutely no one's surprise, the notion of being buried alive completely predates a known society. Accidents happen. However, let's start with the more modern era. Thankfully, today we have quite a few tests to see whether or not a person's really dead. Some examples being checking the dilation of your eyes after shining a light on it, testing the gag reflex, injecting ice water into your ear canal, then checking to see if your eyes begin to flick from side to side. Which just sounds fucking miserable. Probably the most effective and what is considered the last ditch effort is to hook you up to an EEG machine. And it's designed to see if there's any electrical activities in the brain at this point. There's a plethora of more tests that doctors use, but I think you get the gist of it. This this is a far cry from some of the wacky tests humans used to administer on each other to determine if death had occurred pre-20th century. Some of the highlights include chopping off fingers, to shoving needles under toenails or into somebody's heart, writing I am dead with invisible ink on a sheet of paper before placing it over their face. The idea being that when you die, your body emits sulfur, which in turn makes the invisible ink appear. However, as it was noted in the article on LitHub that someone who has rotting teeth may also produce sulfur, so at the time there were probably a lot of false positives. Whoops. Probably my favorite of all of these being how they would test drowning victims. The poor individual would be given a smoke enema in an attempt to warm them up and help them breathe. 
So with the hot smoke being sent up your butt, it would show that in fact, the presence of you seeming dead was in fact false. Despite all these different tests, the fear of being buried alive was still a major deal back then. Given the caliber of these tests, then you can totally tell that yeah, okay, being buried alive was a lot more common back then, albeit at the same time, they weren't like intentionally like malicious. If you know, you don't count the needles in the smoke. Now, the fear of being accidentally buried alive itself may have spawned from a couple different sources. Plenty of mythical stories exist where a relative dies, the spouse is hysterical, saying they aren't dead, only to find out later that they were right. There are literally hundreds of these stories. Well, interestingly enough, the number of reported cases of people being buried alive in the past may have been a bit inflated. This could be for a couple of different reasons, but after a person dies, the body still twitches quite a bit, so this could give off the impression that the body was moving after it was buried. Another, and this is a bit of a stretch, I must confess, and really isn't based off any research I found. However, depending on the era, it could have been used as propaganda. Throughout the centuries, everything from witches to necromancers to sorcerers have been used to scare the common folk. If you have a population that believes a necromancer is attempting to reanimate corpses in your area, you're going to pay a bit more attention to your weekly mass. That's just rampant speculation on my part, though. However, if I don't mention it here, I'm sure it will be brought up, but there is also the Save by the Bell expression, which, according to Wikipedia came about during the Victorian era, where back in the day people would tie a rope around supposed corpse hand and if they rang the bell it would show they're not dead. Two things with this. If this was actually implemented, then I'm sure it saved a lot of people. And two, we just talked about body twitches, so you can imagine a lot of false positives probably happened and that's kind of sad. However, the biggest nail in the coffin to being buried alive in modern times without being considered malpractice or maliciously is embalming. Essentially what happens with the embalming process is that all your blood is drained and instead is replaced with this like kind of embalming type fluid which is designed to keep your body preserved long enough for like open casket funerals, etc. So it's settled. Being buried alive in modern times is just a myth. Actually, no. It's surprisingly very true. Many modern cases exist today, like the tragic death of Rosanja Alameda dos Santos, who, after being declared dead, was later found to have been buried alive after people heard screaming coming from her grave spot and finding scratch marks on the coffin once they exhumed the body. Now, this was a couple of years ago, and considering the fact there was never like a follow-up report to this particular story, I kind of thought for a moment that it might have been a hoax. Then again, this is a private matter, so short of going to the family and asking, we're probably not going to learn the whole story. However, during this time frame, the doctor who pronounced her dead was also accused of malpractice. And unfortunately, that seems to be the main reason for accidental burials in the modern era. Even the inventor of the security coffin was also said to be dead after the accident was suspiciously hurried along and his quote-unquote remains buried. They determined that in fact the man was still alive. I bet you can't guess why he made the security coffin. So the next question that probably crops up is, with embalming and other procedures, how is it a person can even get to the coffin without being dead? And it not being malicious or malpractice? That's uh, simple, really. Depends on what region of the world you live in and what your finances look like. To put it bluntly, a lot of the information I found today on the medical procedures, guidelines, and protocols are taken from North American sources. However, not every country has the same luxury. Take, for example, Ms. Santos, who passed away in Brazil. Now, technically, there isn't a time frame as to when a body has to be cremated, buried, etc. However, traditionally speaking, it is usually buried within 12 hours after death. The only requirement is that the death must be reported within 24 hours in order to receive a death certificate. Compound this with the fact that foul play was suspected and it becomes a bit easier to swallow that an accidental death like this could occur. But there's still the issue of embalming procedures. Why wouldn't the embalming get done, especially when embalming happens even if you're gonna be cremated? Simply put, the shit's expensive. The average cost for embalming is $500 and up, generally not running more than $1,000. In general, a standard funeral with embalming, casket, funeral, etc., will cost at the very least $7,000. Even the average cremation costs anywhere between $4,000 to $7,000. Not everyone just has that kind of money lying around. I was honestly shocked to see the cost of cremation as well, but there is more to it than simply sticking someone in an oven and being done with it. Now, not every funeral home is is full of sadistic monsters that would give a crappy mechanic a run for their money, but when anyone is in an emotionally vulnerable situation, they'll tend to make dumb purchasing decisions. Hey, do what you want to do, of course, but this is one of the reasons why I'm a pretty big advocate for having like a living will or something along those lines made. And its primarily reason is because 
it helps to alleviate some of the grief that a lot of your loved ones are going to be going through in an attempt to make you happy after you're gone. There are plenty of other cases in which people are accidentally buried alive, however, statistically speaking, if you live in a more developed country, your chances are pretty slim. Then again, I hear the security coffins have a bathroom and a radio set up in there, so maybe it's worth skipping the embalming. Now, I also thought about covering the whole myth of does your hair and nails keep growing after you die, but honestly, I feel like that's common knowledge at this point, and then I don't want to be too obvious. However, I feel like someone would bring it up if I didn't at least mention it here, as they are widely believe myths. So we come to the end of this little toe dip into the macabre and it just goes to show you that even though you're expecting one thing you may find a plethora of different shit you weren't expecting. Now I didn't cover everything associated with being buried alive, death myths, etc. So if I forgot anything or wanted to add more feel free to leave me a comment below or reach out to me. Death can be cruel, sometimes it can be funny, but ultimately death is death and everyone still poops. Anyway keep things light and rebellious and I'll see you guys next time.